Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, which is on financing options and scholarships for uh, both the Executive MBA and the Masters in Major Program Management. Uh, my name is Jonathan Dover. I'm a recruitment manager for the Executive MBA program. Um, and also on the panel today, uh, my colleague Sarah Hayton, um, who is a business development manager specifically for the Masters in Major Program Management. Um, and we will also be joined today um, by Ayola Alabi um, from Prodigy Finance, um, who will be able to tell you a, a bit about her business and how they can potentially help. Um, and also Lorraine Wright, um, pleased to say, is going to be joining us today. Um, she uh, recently graduated from the Executive MBA last year. Um, she was part of the, uh, the, the EMBA class, the EMBA 13 class. Um, and she is joining us today to tell us a little bit about um, how she was able to secure funding from her employer for the, the Executive MBA. Um, now, looking at the registrants for today's webinar, it um, looks like that we have people from, from all over the world and from a range of different industries, including uh, consulting, engineering, finance, uh, pharma pharmaceuticals, energy, government, aviation and transport. Um, and that's, you know, that's very indicative, really, of the uh, diversity across um, our executive degree programs. So it's, that's really good to, uh, really good to see. Um, so I want to just start by quickly walking you through uh, the agenda for today's webinar. Um, we'll start by giving you a brief introduction into, into the two uh, executive degree programs that Sarah and I cover. Um, we, will also, we will talk about the benefits of those, and um, also moving on to talk about your investment, not only just in terms of the financial element, but also the time that you need to devote to, to the program. And then um, the, 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 kind of the, the nuts and bolts of this webinar, really talking about how you're going to, to fund your study, be that for the Executive MBA um, or for the, the Master's in Major Program Management. Um, we, will talk about, uh, we will talk about potential loan options, um, how you can secure support from your employer, um, also the different scholarship options. We'll draw your attention to, to those and uh, the, the kind of key criteria and um, which ones you may be able to, to look at, as well as other, other funding sources. Um, and at the end, there will be, be plenty of time um, for you to, to ask, ask your questions, both to, to, our, to ourselves um, and to, to, to Lorraine and Iola as well. Um, so um, we, we, we'll, um, we'll probably not spend too much today t talking about the actual admissions process, um, but I thought it would be useful to um, just give you a brief overview of um, the sort of the typical, typical student profile for the two programs that we look after. So on, on the executive MBA, um, as I'm sure many of you know from your own research, typically people will have around 15 years of work experience um, with a fun, around five years of uh, strategic management experience. Uh, academically, we would look for a 2-1 degree. Um, and there's an average age usually in and around 36 or 37 on, on the program. And each class will typically have around 30 different nationalities and, and 25 different, different industry sectors. And that's, that's, that's true for both the Executive MBA and the, the Masters uh, in Major Program Management. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Fantastic. Um, so now that I'm pretty confident that um, most of most of you who will be attending have joined us. We just to give it a few minutes. Um, I will just cover a couple of quick housekeeping things. You probably will have seen already. Um, we've automatically muted everyone just to make sure that we've got rid of any background noise to, so we're not annoying anybody. Um, let you know we will be circulating these slides and um, very likely we're going to plan the audio as well. So um, you will definitely all be able to get hold of um, the links, um, the text um, that you'll see today. So there'll be a few web pages that we'll be directing you to later. Um, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to, you to think you need to be copying down long URLs or anything like that. We will be circulating these slides um, just after the webinar. And um, as, as Jonathan touched on, there is absolutely questions at the end and in order to do that we would ask that you type your questions into the question box um, through GoToWebinar and, and you can obviously do that at any time so feel free as a question comes up to type that into that question box. Um, it may be that we take it a bit earlier if, particularly if it's one for Prodigy, potentially one for, for Lorraine, we might take that as, as it comes so please do um, pop your question in 
as you think about it. Um, I'd also say if you have any queries around your own um, circumstances, um, particularly if um, we look at it and think, well, that's quite specific, we would absolutely love to arrange um, follow-up calls, um, particularly if we haven't been in contact with you one-to-one -one before. So it may be if we, if we don't get a chance to take your question at the end, um, certainly we will be in contact with you by email or, or by phone later and, and go through your question then. Right, so so coming on to um, the, the sort of what we've called the Y Study and Executive Degree Programme um, with us. I mean, I'm sure um, you've many of you have, have definitely got your reasons already. You've you clearly um, tuned into a webinar with us, so um, clearly you've you've probably spotted all these things. But we thought it might be interesting and and useful to highlight some of the reasons that we know um, students apply for our programs and want to attend um, these two programs at the business school. Um, would say that these programs they're highly highly academic programs, um, rigorous. So you will be doing, you know, with one of these programs, you'll be doing exams. With both, you'll be doing dissertations and written projects. Um, but also, whilst being highly academic, they are at the same time designed to really make an impact on your own business performance and absolutely make an impact um, into your organisation. So um, the modular format, both, um, as we'll come on to later, both programmes are set up as part-time modular programmes. So Everybody stays in full-time work generally. Um, they will fly in from wherever they are in the world to um, attend the modules at Oxford, get that um, fantastic, really important face-to-face -face interaction, not only with the faculty, but with the peer network as well. But it also means that you then, as you attend those modules and go back, as you finish your assignments, all of that, that research, the interaction, the conversations and the debates that you're having will immediately inform what you're doing day to day, whether you are an entrepreneur and you're responsible for your own business, whether you're running a major infrastructure program or sort of delivering a new airport network, all of those things, these programs are really designed to help you make a success of those things. Um, so you'll see, see on the bullets there, we've got personal development and career progression. Um, Clearly, that's something you, you'll probably all be having one-to-one -one conversations with your management teams about. And really, a, um, a University of uh, Oxford qualification, it's really something that, obviously, you can be very proud of. It's going to be very, um, it's going to be recognised very well, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what country you're in. And, um, for example, I'd highlight a couple of the things that uh, in terms of the school awards that we've received recently in December um, 2017 we were really pleased to be awarded business school of the year with the times higher education awards and um, of course the University of Oxford itself was ranked number one in the world um, from the times higher education rankings in 2018 um, so obviously having a University of Oxford qualification, it, it's going to be something that whether you're trying to win new business or, or whether it's it's something that you want on your CV as you apply for a new job, it's really going to sort of distinguish yourself from the competition and help you distinguish yourself. Um, we've, we've noted there the Oxford Network. This is really interesting as well. So not only will you be studying with a, um, a class probably around 60 to 70 um, peers, generally senior people and, and people from throughout the, working throughout the world and who have lived and worked in many countries. Um, so you'll have that um, immediate class network. You will also have the wider school network, so people who are also doing full-time MBAs, uh, part-time postgraduate diplomas. Um, you will also have your college network, so these are both matriculated degree programmes, meaning that you will join, for example, Keeble College, Kellogg College, and you will mix that with people doing um, different programmes, different disciplines, and potentially both undergraduates and postgraduates, depending on which college you join. Um, so that could be something where you maybe you're looking to mentor someone or looking to be mentored um, or, or potentially looking to employ someone. So maybe some, some undergraduates doing uh, different degree programmes. Um, and I, I would really highlight as well our um, Oxford Business Alumni Network. So as you graduate and um, we really hope that you will stay in contact, um, I'd pretty much say that most of our students think that's um, really um 
key really that most of our students stay in contact they will come back to Oxford to visit us but also they will um, meet in in chapters regional chapters throughout the world and our business alumni network currently sits at 17,000 people worldwide so that's a really um, exciting thing that you can connect into and something that would help maybe your current business or any future business ideas that you have okay um, I'm now going to pass back over to, to Jonathan and he will be able to talk a little bit more about um, your investment. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I think at, at this point, I think it's important to, to draw your attention to, to a couple of things. I mean, you can see there on, on the slide the kind of the, the figures involved. But what, the first thing I actually wanted to highlight is the uh, for the executive MBA, the, um, the fee can actually be broken down into three installments. So when you look at when you see that that figure that's applicable for for the next intake, and um, that can be split into a deposit of 15%, which is which you pay up front, followed by 50% um, within one month of the start date, and then the re remaining balance, which is uh, is, is 35 35%. Um, that can actually be paid within 10 months of starting. So I think when you're considering your, your various different financing options, it's important to, to, to bear that in mind. Um, and uh, that is actually e exactly the same situation for the, uh, for the Masters in, in, in Major Program Management. Um, so just wanted to, to flag that. In terms of what those, those fees include, um, they include all of your, your tuition fees, and matriculation, and everything during the modules. Um, they, 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 don't necess they, they don't include accommodation and travel um, when you're based in Oxford, but added to that, and that's something that's not shown on the slide, um, when you're on one of the international modules, um, your accommodation during those weeks will actually be covered by, by the fee. So when you're, when you're doing your, your, your sums and your, your, your arithmetic, um, that's definitely something to, uh, to, to bear in mind. Now, in, in terms of the, the structure of the, the programs, and uh, Sarah's already touched on this, but the, uh, the, the executive MBA is a, uh, is a part-time modular program made up of 16 week-long modules. Um, so in effect, you will be based in Oxford for one week in every uh, in every five or six over over a twenty one month period. Um, now those weeks are are pretty intense in terms of your your time commitment. Um, you will be um, you know expected to work some some long days during during those weeks. Um, and then the idea is that you do that in conjunction with, uh, with with your current role. That you're able to go back into your business and uh, and apply what you've learned on a, on a concurrent basis. And uh, and that the format works really well from from that perspective. Um, now there is some some work to be done during the uh, d during the, the weeks in between the modules as well. Um, so you will be expected to do around eight to ten hours per week of, of preparation and, and pre-reading in between those modules. That, again, as you would expect, that will, will vary depending on on which modules you're in between, um, and it's very much up to, to the individual how you want to, to organise that. You know, you may want to to to, to cram that all into to one week or two weeks, or 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 spread it over the uh, over over the course of the, the five or six weeks. Um, so it's very much up to you how you do that. But I think just goes that, that just goes back to my point regarding it's not just a financial commitment, which is you know the, the, the purpose of this webinar, but there is also a time commitment involved. And certainly when you're having those discussions with your employer, it's important that, uh, that everyone's on the same page, that you're going into it with your eyes open from, from that perspective as well. Um, so moving on to, uh, to, to the funding aspect, and just to sort of introduce, I guess, what we're, what we're going to be discussing today. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is to, to really set out the options available to you as the prospective applicant um, when it comes to funding, so that you can start thinking about what might, what might work best for you. Um, so a, a number of you will be, be looking at, uh, at self-financing, but within that you, you can look at, at loan options, and that's why we have Iola here from Prodigy Finance today, a business that we work very closely with, and have a good a good relationship with just to, uh, to to really give you an idea of how that could potentially be built into to your financing options. Um, the, the the second option that we will look at is employer funding. Um, again, I mentioned earlier that uh, Lorraine Wright is joining us today, one of our, our recent Ember alums, um, and she will be able to tell us a little bit about how she was able to approach her employer to to secure funding for the program, how she built her business case, etc., etc. So hopefully you will will find that useful as well. Um, and lastly, we will also talk a little bit about the uh, the different scholarships that uh, are available to you. 
Um, there are a number of, diff of different scholarships that are specific to, to the executive MBA and, uh, and, and the Masters in, in Major Program Management um, and, and also other scholarships that you can, can look at as well. So we'll give you today a bit of a, an overview of those and um, we'll discuss some of the, the kind of key criteria that you need to meet in order to, uh, in, in, in order to qualify for some of those scholarships and hopefully answer any, any questions that you have regarding those. Um, so again, any questions that you have, have over the course of this webinar, feel free to put those into the question box and we will deal with them as, as and when. And there'll be a period at the end as well um, to, to have more, a more dedicated period of, of Q&A as well. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, I'm going to go on to, to loans first and I'm going to just um, mention a couple um, First on this first slide, a couple of loans that are applicable to um, applicants currently based in the UK or EU. Um, so you'll see on this slide, um, for those um, people based in the UK, professional and career development loans. Um, what I would say actually, first off, particularly the, the loans that we're running through and then some of the scholarships later, um, we are sort of obviously highlighting the, these uh, options to people now we would strongly strongly encourage you to do your own research there are so many different um, terms and conditions and um, they're going to be reasons why some people might be um, able to apply for these and others might not and um, the amount that you can borrow will, will vary as well of course um, so I would just strongly encourage you um, particularly as we uh, circulate these slides to go onto the websites and, and contact the the various organisations directly and, and get more information. Um, but the first one there you'll see is um, professional and career development loans. You will be able to borrow um, somewhere between £300 and £10,000. And this is an initiative through the UK government where they pay the interest whilst you're studying. Um, and there's a specific reference number for the business school here that you will need to use 8518 and um, obviously there is more information as I said on the website there on the on the uh, UK government website under career development loans. Uh, the second option listed there we're highlighting this today the UK master's loans um, but we really have to stress unfortunately that the eligibility eligibility criteria has not yet been released um, and including which programs so um, we are listing this today because um, in previous years it, it has been possible to access this, um, we believe, but this is one where you may have to, um, or you'll certainly have to plan around it and then as the criteria is released, do a little bit more research, a little bit more digging and get in very quickly. We are very, very conscious here that our programme deadline dates for applying, particularly to the 2018, September 2018, cohorts for both these programs you're really looking at applying by sort of May June at the latest and we'll come on to some other deadlines later um, and it may be that the criteria isn't released for these loans until um, sort of again May June this year so just one to be aware of at the moment and um, finally the the link there the graduate.ox.ac.uk slash loans link that will take you to the University of Oxford web pages and that's a really good resource we will be coming on mentioning more pages um, web pages for the University of Oxford website would really encourage you to go on there um, spend some time searching through the various options putting your own details in there and, and seeing what it brings back for you and then um, looking at loans available to um, people in uh, the US in particular. So um, the US private education loans, many people in the US will know um, this as the sort of Sally May loans. Um, there are other providers. What I would say is Oxford will work with, with whichever lender that you, you choose. However, um, at the moment, as we know, Sally May is the only US lender that we're aware of that is willing to lend to students at a foreign school, so students at a non-US school. Um, but sort of just, again, to be aware of that, um, Sally May would work directly with us, so um, they would disperse the money to us once you've arranged a loan with them, um, and, and that's something that's something that you would obviously follow up yourself and they'll let us know that you're looking into and that that's how you would be uh, financing or part financing your degree program. Um, also listed on there obviously the uh, veteran affairs 
um, US Department of Western Affairs option. And I should say this is very much a grant rather alone. So um, and I, I'm pretty sure that people who are um, eligible for this would probably already know much more about it than I do. But there's there's a link there. There's much more information on our website and um, very much a grant rather than a loan, so you're not paying it back. Um, the US, um, US federal student loans, I do need to say that that is unfortunately for MMPM students only, so not the executive MBA students or candidates. Um, again, one to look at our University of Oxford web pages you may be able to um, borrow the full cost of attendance. So um, not your accommodation and travel costs, but the full programme fee costs. And um, again, that's one that you would look into yourself and, and arrange that loan and then um, come back to us and let us know. And the loan company would work directly with the school to disperse those payments against your fees. OK, so as we mentioned earlier, we are really pleased to have Ayula from Prodigy Finance with us. Um, I will say many of our students use a loan from Prodigy Finance. So um, our MBA students, executive MBA students and our MSc and major program management students. Um, and, and because of that, we, we've um, really pleased to invite Ayula here from Prodigy to give us some more details on this option. Sorry for the hold up. Ayula, would you like to um, take it from here for us? Perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, thank you uh, for having me here today. For me, it's an absolute pleasure. And um, hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to, just a little bit of housekeeping before I launch into this presentation, um, which shouldn't be more than a few minutes long. Um, I am hoping that the sound is going to be okay. Uh, there are quite a few building works uh, uh, just outside our window in the London office, which is very, very helpful. Um, I will just put myself on mute if ever a drill goes off, um, and then I'll resume um, a few seconds later. Um, so just apologies in advance for that, but hopefully that shouldn't be an issue at all. Take it away. <laughs> Um, so, as you can see, that's just the introductory slide. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Prodigy Finance before. Um, as Sarah kindly said, we... Sorry, I'm just going to put myself on mute because there's uh, that noise. Sorry. Okay, so um, we'll just pause for, for a second. Um, um, I'm back again. Fantastic, thank <laughs> you. Um, it just may be a little, a little ad hoc, me going in and out. I'm really sorry for the sound, everybody. Um, but yes, um, as Sarah kindly said, we have had a great relationship over the last five, six years. Um, and we have quite a few quite a few people who have taken our loans. Um, so yes, essentially, we're just going to be discussing all of the options that are available to you today. Um, just to give you a very quick introduction to who we are and what we do. You'll see from this slide that it's all fairly self-explanatory, um, but the, the most important thing and the most exciting thing, I suppose, is that we are a truly international company. So we're able to provide loans to not just international students, but because we are FCA regulated, we can also provide loans to um, residents and nationals of the UK, which is great news. It just means that most of you listening now will be eligible from a nationality perspective. Um, to this date, we've actually funded students from almost 120 countries. Um, we have dispersed a lot, a lot of loans, as you'll see there from the slide. Um, and we continue to grow, uh, which means that we continue to be able to have smoother processes um, and to make your loan application process as pleasant as it could possibly be. So we've got quite a few um, benefits, of course, and, and, and uh, eligibility points and, and terms here. These will all come up on the slide for you. Um, so feel free to either take a, you know, a screenshot of this information or um, to visit our website um, afterwards. But just to talk you through this without parroting exactly what's on this screen there, um, I've just covered the nationality um, eligibility criteria 
which is essentially too big to families out for most people. Um, of course, we are we are going to be assessing whether or not we think it's responsible for us to lend to you. That's very, very important to us um, because we do like to, to play the game correctly, as it were, and that's why you will be subjected to our own sort of in-house cross-border credit assessment when you are filling in your application form. Um, a huge benefit to taking a quality finance loan is the fact that there is no collateral or any sort of guarantee required from you at all. Um, we believe that, you know, and I think to be honest, rightly so, that if you are good enough to get into a top program at a top university, then you are, you're probably going to be a safe bet um, for, for taking a property finance loan. And so that's what we're basing that on. Um, we do have competitive interest rates, and we do encourage you to, to think about this properly before you are taking any loan, of course. Um, you'll want to be looking at the APRs there. Um, and uh, there is a, a healthy grace period there for you of three months after um, your first disbursement. So disbursements typically take place a few weeks after the start of your course. Um, so you'll have you know, a whole term pretty much. So for the whole of Michaelmas, you won't really necessarily need to be thinking about that. Um, another great thing to, to point out is that there aren't any early repayment penalties. So if you were in a position to be able to, to make an early repayment, that is totally fine with us. Just get in touch with me and I will put in touch with the right people. Um, and your loan terms here, we're really pleased to be able to say that we can offer loans in either dollars, US dollars, or GBP. Um, our minimum loan size does differ according to, uh, to which currency you're taking your loan in, but essentially it's going to be either £10,000 or US dollars Our maximum loan size is capped at 80% cost of tuition. So that's essentially exactly what it says there, it's not travel or accommodation costs. Um, your origination fee, your admin fee, however you want to call it, is going to be fully amortised, and that's 2.5% of your total loan amount. Um, and then the rates are there for you to see. Um, what I will stress here is the next point, that it's an individual assessment uh, process. So when you submit your application, we will be assigning you um, uh, an interest rate um, based on the profile that we see. And we will also be offering you either a seven or 10 year loan repayment term, again, based on the profile that we see from you. Um, you will have noticed that because I said earlier on that there's no penalty for early repayments or, um, sorry, there's no penalty or fees for early repayments, that, uh, that repayment term is there the maximum maximum length. So if you would like to repay your loan sooner, then by all means feel free to do that. Um, and the last benefit um, that we have in common with, I suppose, other other loan providers as well, um, a few others, is that we're going to be dispersing funds directly to um, to the finance at Oxford. So that means that you don't really have to worry um, about anything happening or going wrong in that regard. Um, the borrowing process, you'll be pleased to know, I think this is pretty much, we're pretty much there. Um, the borrowing process is really, really quite simple. Um, we have a lovely graphic there on the right hand side. If you are anything like me and your eyesight and you've got, your eyesight is not the best, then I'll just talk you through that to help, to help explain. Um, so the initial application process, um, which is at the top left hand side of that wonderful graphic, it is only going to take you 20 minutes or so. Um, you log on to our website, um, you start, you select the, the relevant course, EMBA or MPM, um, and you start filling out your application form. Essentially what we're looking for there is, uh, we're not looking for you to provide verification of any of the information that you provide. So this step is entirely paperless and entirely online. And we would just like to have a quick snapshot of essentially who you are and how you are planning on funding um, your studies. Um, once you've submitted that, then we will usually get back to you within a couple of minutes with a provisional um, offer. Um, in some cases, we will be sort of doing spot checks, um, and in some particularly, uh, and in, th in some cases as well, that the credit uh, committee do just want to take a look at the at the end. 
individual applications um, in a little bit more detail. And if that is you, then it means that the team will get back to you as quickly as possible and they will not take any longer than five days to do so. Um, the verification step um, comes obviously immediately after your provisional offer. So this is where um, it becomes a little more um, like applying for any other form of uh, credit or finance. So we will be asking you to provide supporting documentation based on the information that we've seen um, in your in your application form. So typically we'll need obviously proof of ID, um, any sort of proof of the salary that, that you said you have. We'll also need um, proof of any sort of sponsorships or scholarships or um, any family uh, support that you're getting as well. Um, and we'll need proof of any savings that, that you say you have. So all of that will be self-explanatory and we have um, a team who will be there to guide you through that. And worst case scenario, I am always going to be at the other end of, of an email as well to be able to help you out. Um, we will ask you to sign your loan agreement um, uh, closer to the start of your course. So um, if you are an international student and you're traveling to Oxford from abroad, then typically that option will be available for you to sign online, I should add, um, once you've arrived in the UK. Um, if you are already resident here, um, then it means that you, you may be given that option a little bit, a little bit sooner because you'll already be in the UK. Um, as I said, funds are dispersed straight to Oxford, so there's uh, nothing much for me to dwell on there. Um, and you do have your three month grace period um, for the first term pretty much, after which point we will start um, taking uh, taking payments for you from you. Um, excellent, so it really couldn't be any more simple than that. Um, that said, please feel free to, again, take another screenshot of, of this slide here, um, and you can send me an email, and I will get back to you as soon as possible um, with, any, with any of your queries. Um, it's just a, a heads up, actually, um, for, for all of you wanting to send me an email. I will be on annual leave for about three weeks as of the middle of next week, so feel free to send me an email today or at the weekend or um, Monday or Tuesday, and I will connect you with the right people and, and get your applications moving. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. There's actually been quite a few questions coming in through the um, through the uh, question function on GoToWebinar. So if you don't mind, I'm going to just pose a few of those to you now while we've got you. Um, just <laughs> just clarifying a few things, I guess. Um, so, for example, the three month grace period that you mentioned, someone's um, asked whether that um, starts directly after you you start so maybe on the first day of your module does the three months grace start then or does it start after graduation so that will start um from disbursement and funds are due to be dispersed typically two to three weeks after the start of your course so you're looking at um yes definitely three months around about three months or just over after the start of your course fantastic thank you um someone sort of queried um if you've got average credit ratings, um, how would that impact your application? Assuming you've already got your offer from the University of Oxford, is there then a separate process to go through? Is that perhaps more of a, it's a separate application process every time, isn't it? So I, I guess what we're saying there, it's, it's useful for each individual to, to come to Prodigy and, and have that conversation, is that right? Exactly. So I would advise in that instance to just to go online and to fill out the application form anyway. Um, and then maybe once you've done that, to just send me a little note um, so I can, can keep an eye on it. Um, I'll know pretty much straight away whether or not it's been flagged by the credit committee or whether it's uh, whether you've got a provisional offer straight away. Um, if it has been flagged by the credit committee um, and there are other sort of uh, uh, you have extenuating circumstances or there's more context and colour that you would like to, to give to your application, then I'm going to be the person that you should be getting in touch with and I'll be able to pass that on to them before they are then able to come back to you with a final provisional offer. That's, actually, that's fantastic and it's just sort of raised another point of a question that's come through. I think you may have answered it then, but just to clarify, someone's asked, is it necessary to start your application for financing 
in parallel for application with your your application to the school. From my point of view as a, as a sort of admissions um, side of things, I would say to some extent it depends where you are, so which programme you're looking to start. Um, for example, the closer we get to the September start for the executive MBA, um, the more I would encourage someone to look at both things in parallel. Um, I mean, I know, I know that you guys at Prodigy will need the offer from us, but um, could you just talk a bit about again about when to start the the conversation with Prodigy? Would you start it before yeah. you apply to the program, um, or yeah? <laughs> it's always a bit of a tricky one, actually, <laughs> to be honest, though, because um, because you technically speaking, you can start your application without having uh, provided proof that you've been accepted. Um, what I mean, if you were to do that, then what would happen is that would then just extend the total length of time it takes for you to get from A to Z, as it were. So I always recommend that people, uh, where possible, um, wait for them to have received their admission um, and then start looking into the other documents that they'll need to they'll need to provide as well. And then in that instance, once you start your application, it's going to be obviously those initial 20 minutes and then however long it takes you to upload your um, documents and then uh, and then that will be it. Um, I agree with you that the closer we get to the, the start of, of term as it were, um, it's probably a good idea to be thinking about uh, making a, uh, an application for your British finance loan in parallel with your application to Saeed. Um, but yes, it, it's going to be totally up to you. In that instance, that's fine but we'll just need your documentation to be provided as soon as possible. We do um, give people a little bit of leeway around about the start of term for this very reason, just to make sure that every all of the latecomers have um, tied up their applications um, and everything is all good on our side and that's why we don't disperse until two to three weeks after the start of term. Fantastic, fantastic. And in terms of the disbursements am i right in thinking um and apologies I, th I think you did touch on this the disbursements will match our um the installments that the school asks for don't they so in terms of what the the candidate or the applicant needs to worry about once the the loan has been agreed um one of the questions was do the disbursements match the installments that the school asks for um, oh, honestly, I'm not too sure. The one thing I can say is that we always liaise very, very closely with, um, with uh, Trish in the finance office, um, just to make sure that that's all that, that she's sort of happy with that as well. Because obviously, we provide loans for some of the MBA class too, so we will typically do one bulk disbursement. Um, what we will be doing, however, is providing an up-to-date list. Um, on a regular basis throughout the year. So I think we do, we provide a list on a fortnightly basis, which means that um, everybody will be aware of who is receiving a property loan and how much for. So it may be that your loan is not for the full instalment amount, in which case um, you just need to speak to, speak to the relevant people to make sure that, that you're covering the excess. Brilliant. Um, that that sounds spot on for me. I think I, I phrased that question really badly because um, from, from from this side of things, um, it's um, it's absolutely true that that you guys work so closely with us. It's not that um, you need to meet the um, the three different payments that that we talked about earlier that Jonathan talked about earlier. It, it's uh, probably will work with the school and make sure with the, the proportion that you're borrowing that that will come through to us um, and that actually joins on to so, so another question that we had while well, mentioning that I'm getting a loan impact my application decision I, I would actually say um, definitely not it wouldn't um, in any way impact the application decision and it's actually really really useful for us to know as, as Ola said um, you know the, we do work closely with Prodigy and um, our finance team will need to know our admissions team will need to know um, for example when when you're given an invoice when that will be paid how that will be paid and we really pride ourselves on having really um, good relationships with our candidates in terms of you know keeping in contact with you understanding any pressures you might have in terms of um, payment of the fees and when to pay the fees so um, please don't worry it's it's really useful information to um, list on your application if you're either looking for a scholarship or a loan and um, and to keep in contact with with the team about how that's going um, just look at other questions for you Ayla um, 
one other quick one I'm going to squeeze in here um, about regions that you, you lend to. Um, we have someone specifically, I believe, based in Canada. Is that one of the regions that you cover at the moment? I'm sure it is. Yeah. So um, the vast majority is really, really unusual. Um, I'm going to say this, and I'm really hoping it's not going to come back to, uh, to me. But it's really unusual that we aren't able to, to fund uh, your nationality. Um, so we have a list of eligible nationalities in our uh, FAQ section of the website. Of the website. So please just take a look there. The chances are. Um, we will be able to fund you. I'm just trying to think, based on last year's sort of cohorts, I don't think we declined anybody um, based on nationality. So that's just to give you an idea. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, I think that's it for now. If, if it's possible for you to stay online, that's great. Obviously, we have your contact details. Everyone um, listening has your contact details. So if any reason we're not able to connect with you in the end and we, and we have a couple of questions, we'll make sure that the questions get to you and we know that people have your contact details. Thank you so much for your time. That's been um, really, really helpful. Fantastic. Um, before I hand over to Jonathan to, to continue on a couple more options. I'm just gonna mention a couple more things on the questions that have come through. Um, someone's asked whether it's possible to apply for a scholarship and a loan at the same time. Um, I, I, I would absolutely say yes, it's possible and it's, it's probably advisable. So potentially with all of the scholarships, you're looking at applying for a scholarship generally quite early on and perhaps not getting the result of that scholarship. We'll come on to women's scholarships. Often you won't get the, the decision, the outcome of the women's scholarship into quite close to your programme start date. And we would absolutely always encourage you, always say, um, have a... Um, a backup plan, have have another option in place. So yes, I can't see that there would be anything wrong in um, particularly applying for a loan with, with Prodigy or with any of the other options that we've talked through and having that there. Um, obviously, I don't know the technical details in terms of signing paperwork or that kind of thing, um, but you would um, be encouraged to have a backup plan and to keep in contact with us about decisions of scholarships or in contact with the awarding body for that scholarship um, because often the timings don't quite work so that you can just do one and then start looking at the other. Um, the other quick thing I wanted to mention, we have a couple of people on here who are interested in our postgraduate diplomas, the um, sort of 12, 14 month, 14 month part-time modular programs um, that are modules from our executive MBA. Um, currently, I believe they are not something that, that Prodigy Finance are offering loans to. Um, but I will make sure that I get in contact with the, the people that have asked those questions. Um, there may be other options that we can look into and it would be really good to continue that conversation outside of the webinar. Right, um, so I'm really conscious that time is ticking on and I'm now going to hand back over to, to Jonathan to talk about sponsorship from your organisation. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Ayla. I hope you're uh, going somewhere nice on your holiday in a few weeks' time where Sarah and I are both uh, with very jealous here. Um, but in the, in the next part of the webinar, I want to talk about um, how you go about securing sponsorship from your organization, if that is an avenue that you're looking to explore. Now, some organizations, and this, this arguably is more relevant to the, the Masters in Major Program Management, but is, is also applicable to, to the EMBA. Uh, some organizations choose to sponsor several candidates within an intake or over several intake years, and then that creates within that organization a kind of a common understanding, if you like, um, and a positive shift in performance across the team. So that, that is something that's potentially worth exploring within your, your organization when you're, you're talking to either some, someone senior in, in HR or indeed your line manager. Um, now, if you are looking to seek support from your employer, it may be helpful to start thinking about the following ideas in terms of how you would put together your, your business case. Um, the first of those is thinking about a skills gap analysis. So you could have a think about where you currently fit within your organization um, and how the program that you're looking to study at Oxford um, could enhance the contribution that you make to the organization. So that, that, that could be a good starting point. Um, you may also want to, to match your objectives in undertaking the program 
um, to those of your organization by analyzing sort of quite forensically really the module content of, uh, of the program that you're looking to, to undertake. Um, because when you're presenting your business case to your organization, um, they will want to see that uh, the, the specific modules that you're, you're studying and, uh, and the learning that you're going to be doing is actually going to be relevant to, to their organization and, uh, and your role within that. So definitely important to start thinking about that and so certainly from, uh, from an EMBA point of view, um, which electives you might look to take which might fit in best with, uh, with your organization's structure and, uh, and, and how they do things. Um, you may also want to think about um, how an increased knowledge of the areas covered by the program, um, be, be that the executive MBA or one of our other executive degree programs, could actually benefit your organization. So tying into the previous point, really, um, but you might want to, to think about the specific benefits of each program to your organization um, rather than just thinking about it generally. Um, how could how could each program um, affect the organization that you're a part of and actually you know really, really add value? Um, so at this point, and uh, apologies for the uh, the delay, Lorraine, but we've we've got to you eventually. Um, I want to, to introduce Lorraine Wright, um, who completed her executive MBA uh, last year. Um, she was part of our EMBA 13 cohort, um, and she was successful in securing funding for her executive MBA um, from her organisation, uh, which is uh, UBS, um, uh, an organisation I'm sure most of you are familiar with. First of all, can you hear me, Lorraine? I can. Yeah, perfect. Loud, loud and clear. Thanks for joining us today. Are you keeping well? Yeah, very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Not, not, a, not a problem. And sorry to, sorry to keep you waiting, but you can, uh, you can never plan these things. Uh, um, do you want to maybe just start by, by introducing yourself, um, telling, t telling everyone a bit about your, your current role, um, and then we can, uh, we can move on and talk about uh, how you went about securing uh, funding for your, your executive MBA. Brilliant, sure. Thanks, Joseph. Thanks, Sarah, for having me. And also interesting to hear about what Quantity Finance do as well. Very interesting. So um, I do urge people to also explore that avenue. Um, so as 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 uh, Jonathan mentioned, so my name is Lorraine Wright. Um, I have yet to graduate. So I graduated in March, uh, but I was on the program um, 2016 to 2017. I finished and completed the back end of last year and will be graduating very soon. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so in terms of my role, so I uh, work currently actually post uh, the Ember, um, I've actually moved roles, um, which is, um, I would say largely due to um, the work that I did do on the executive MBA program that have moved to a function I'm very excited about. Uh, so I'm responsible for the IT platform that supports a lot of uh, UBS's social impact elements and work that we do there around fundraising and grant making to social enterprises. Um, so that's the work that I've moved into post my MBA. Um, prior to that, I was largely working on uh, strategic change programs, um, leading uh, both IT and regulatory initiatives as well. Uh, so I joined UBS in 2010. Um, Initially, as a consultant working for Accenture at the time, then I uh, came internally um, to the bank in 2011. Um, so, in terms of my journey uh, towards getting the sponsorship and funding that I needed for the executive MBA, um, very early on when I joined the bank, I always knew that I wanted to do an MBA in some form or another, whether it was a full time MBA or whether it was an executive MBA, um, always wanted to do that. Um, I had very early on planted the seed in terms of um, giving some kind of subliminal messages to a lot of my line managers um, that it was something that I wanted to do. So every time we had objective setting sessions or we had development plan sessions, that would be something that I would always have um, on the radar and I would have those conversations with my line manager. Um, so very early on had that, um, those discussions and really every time we um, I changed jobs. I always made that. I made it. A, 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 I had to make it um, part of the top of the conversation, so that the, the my next line manager know that it was something that I, I wanted to do. Um, so at UBS, we actually have a um, external education policy. Now, to my knowledge to date, over the last five years, I am not to have anyone that's been funded for the executive MBA program other than myself. I do know there are other people that are doing the program and there are some other people that uh, within within the bank that have done both programs that uh, you've been made aware of today. Um, but whether they've been funded fully by UBS such as my one, I, I'm unsure of that. So um, even if 
if you aren't aware of your company doing it, but I'm, I'm, I'm a testament to the fact that you can still go and try and, and see whether or not you can get the funding and support that you, you need. Um, so, in terms of how I, I, I kind of went about doing this, um, I actually applied for the MBA prior to, or the to MBA prior to getting the funding secured. And I did that largely because um, the company that we work for, UBS, is a, is, a, is a fairly large company. And I think, given the fact that I've been speaking about doing the MBA program for um, a number of years at that point, I wanted to show them at that, that given point that I was very serious. So I, similar to what everyone's doing now, I attended various webinars. As Sarah mentioned, I also built, built relationships with the administration team um, and um, started to really have a better understanding for, for what was going on and, and how to apply. Um, I spoke to a number of alumni, uh, the alumni as well, just to, again, have an understanding of how they went about their process. So for me, I actually went through that whole application process, um, but I did that knowing that my line manager I have had that conversation with my line manager and knew that in principle he was going to be supporting me. But I didn't have the funding in place at that time. I kind of took a step of faith and um, and, and or leap of faith and um, did that um, without the actual funding in place. Um, but uh, just, just, just a point of reference, I had built a very good relationship with my line manager. My line manager was um, very close to the group group executive board, um, so I knew that if there was something that he could do, um, I was confident that he would be able to do that. So I went away um, and, I, and I applied for Oxford, I got in, got my acceptance letter and I presented it back, and that's when I kicked off a lot of the processes around HR and had to do that very rapidly in order to get the money to secure for um, the deposit to require, etc. Um, so when I applied to get the funding, I had to, similar to what Jonathan mentioned, I had to pull together a business place. And I did take a top-down and bottom-up approach. I, 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 I looked at myself and my career and what I wanted to achieve and, and made it clear that for me, I wanted to fill in my career. I needed um, almost to try and get that, to fill in the toolbox that I needed um, to progress my career and also build the confidence I needed as a leader and to, to execute my day job. So my business came to really around that, but I also married it with some of the, the elements that uh, Jonathan mentioned. So I also looked and, and, and forensically looked at the, the modules and looked at what I could extract from those, whether it was strategic leadership, whether it was marketing, whether it was accounting, whether it was public finance, whatever it was, I looked at those elements and I pulled those bits together and I, I, I pieced them to, to build my business case. That business case went through a couple of refinements, working very closely with my line manager, and then that got presented to his line manager who happened to sit in the big executive board. So it was that 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 process that allowed me to, to get the buy-in that I needed uh, quite seat from the senior management team um, to get the funding. Now, it wasn't as smooth sailing as, as I make out. Initially, the bank were going to provide me with um, about £10,000. Um, and I fought quite hard against that. So initially, that was what they were going to support me with, um, together with some time off. Um, I fought that quite heavily, uh, given how long I've been working the bank. And I managed to get um, too much most of the, the course sponsored as well as uh, um, uh, additional study leave, as well as um, uh, some allocation towards any books that I might need to purchase. Uh, so I managed to secure that from the bank. And um, however, the commitment they required from me was that I would need to stay and remain in the bank for uh, at least one year post the program. So that's Pretty much the process I went through. Um, as I said, the majority of the, the course was sponsored, but um, bear in mind the number of addition, the, the, the additional costs that you do need to, to, to fork out yourself. Um, for example, the, the foundation in Oxford, um, the flights, uh, the international modules. I think I reserved, I reserved or had spent or taken an extra twenty thousand um, pounds for the additional um, elements. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, over and above your your your, um, your course, um, that's why I'll probably include uh, some nights out as well. Um, but, um, just to <laughs> sure, surely not. So to bear that in mind when you are budgeting as well. So that in principle was the process I I took. Um, that's great, Lorraine. Thank you for that, and that's a, a good comprehensive overview, really, of um, of 
you know what you can uh, what what you can do really to to secure funding. And I think that Lorraine's an excellent example, as she said, of someone who works for an organisation that isn't uh, doesn't necessarily have a track record of sponsoring people. Um, but you shouldn't be discouraged by that. And uh, you know each each individual case is is different, and it may well be that uh, if you have the right conversations with the right people, um, you might be able to to unlock that door, as it were. Um, so there's a couple of questions, Lorraine, that have kind of come in as you've been been talking. So I just wanted to, to kind of flag those. Um, one of which was, did you did you explore other funding options, or were you always were you always looking at uh, at, at, sp at sponsorship as your kind of key avenue? Uh, good question. Um, I, I I primarily looked in uh, into sponsorship, but I my backup plan was to probably remortgage my house or do something like okay. that. I definitely wanted to do the executive MBA. Um, so um, I I really wanted to ship. I had a backup. Okay, and and something that you uh, you touched on it just just now actually was the the, the living cost aspect. Um, any any sort of uh, tips or hints to add around around that in terms of accommodation and, and and the travel to and from Oxford that kind of thing. Yeah. So very early on, I think I made a mistake. So I did a lot of um, I was getting my own my own room and accommodation. So I get in hotels and etc. for myself. Um, but towards I, what I should have done, um, and which was really, really, really great, is I ended up getting Airbnbs, sharing with um, a couple of the cohort um, people from the cohort, and that really helped to build your bonds with with your, with your, with your colleagues. And so much so that we we just had to, it was a great time. You know, there'll be times sadly when we all come back to the apartment and study together and and, and practice some negotiation techniques together. But that was all part and parcel parcel of, of the whole experience. So um, I would say um, save to, 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 to reduce on the, the money spent and um, try as much as possible to start building relationships with your cohort and, and, and go down that Airbnb uh, route. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point, actually, because um, as, as you've alluded to there, hotel accommodation in Oxford um, can, be, can be relatively expensive. And uh, so certainly those kind of options like looking at, at Airbnb and, uh, you know, once you kind of develop relationships with other people in your cohort, you can look at sort of doing joint things with, with them. And that, that can be a really, a really good option on the, uh, the accommodation front. Um, one other question that, that's come through, and this isn't necessarily, I guess, specifically funding related, but it kind of leads on from it. Um, how, how easy did you find it to demonstrate to UBS the, the kind of the tangible benefit that you gained from the program in terms of, you know, w w taking what you'd learned on the EMBA and putting it back into your, your day job on a, on, a, on a sort of concurrent basis, if you like? That's a really good question. Um, I, I um, I'll say it's a little bit different for me because it's been a little bit intangible, and that's only because I've moved roles during my time working at uh, being at Oxford. So, um, primarily, one of the most tangible things I would say, actually, when I was um, working on my previous role, um, I just passed my accounting exam, um, and there was some elements that we were doing around at UBS and looking at some of our accounting systems and, and um, uh, to support a new entity that we were building at the time. And for me, it was very very, very valuable to have the understanding of, and I, and I admittedly didn't have a clue in terms of accounting beforehand. So it was for me, I think that's a tangible example that I was able to literally take what I'd learned in class and apply it to what I was doing in my day job at the time. Um, so that was quite timely. Other, other areas I'll say is a little bit more intangible. Um, I, I developed more confidence. I had more of a toolbox. I had more of an understanding of the business landscape. Um, so I think that probably came out in different ways. So it's less about the, the actual tangible outcomes, but I think it also helps me in terms of trying to get to the, the role that I'm doing now um, in a more intangible way. So building relationships, um, the, the line manager I'm working for now is actually an Oxford alum. So I think we had an opportunity to, to connect on that level as well. So I think those are multiple um, intangible ways that you could demonstrate that, that kind of um, the, the, the investment that, that they that's great, Lorraine. Thank you. Um, no, I'm conscious that uh, time has, has beaten us somewhat. We've hit the three o'clock mark. So um, in the interest of covering the final couple of slides, um, thank you very much. Obviously, if you can stay on the line um, for, for, for a little while, then great. But I appreciate that you're um, a bit back to back today, I think. So no, no worries if not. But uh, thank you for your uh, your input there and your insight. That's been been really useful. And I'm sure the... Uh, anyone wants to catch me, um, I'm available on LinkedIn. Just search me and I could connect with anyone. I do need to drop now, but I'm, I'm more than happy to answer. That's amazing, Lorraine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.
Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Um, I will. Um, I would just acknowledge, as, as Jonathan mentioned, we've used the full hour that we um, we promoted this webinar. Um, lasting, um, we will um, we will persevere. We've got um, about four slides left, three to four slides left, and these mostly cover scholarship options. So um, Jonathan and I will stay here. We totally appreciate some of you may have to drop off the call. As I said at the beginning, we will be circulating the slides um, um, and very likely the video too. So um, don't worry if you need to go, and we will make sure this this is sent over to you by email. Um, what I also need to quickly touch on as well is. Um, in response to one of the questions to Prodigy Finance about the disbursements meeting the timing of the payment instalments being due, um, what I should have stressed um, was, of course, um, you need to acknowledge that the 15% programme deposit payment um, would need to be made um, by yourselves regardless. So um, Prodigy will cover up to 80% of the programme fee. Um, we asked for a 15 deposit percent deposit I'm also aware there's a there's five percent missing there but um, ignoring that for a second the 15 percent deposit would would need to be made regardless if you've arranged um, a full uh, a full loan of 80 percent with Prodigy um, and that deposit would need to be made to secure your your program place and start conversations around your college place and so forth um, again please do get in contact with us either um, at the business school to talk about the the deposit part or with Prodigy directly to talk about Prodigy loans Okay, so on to scholarships for women. So um, these are scholarships that you would um, apply for through the business school, um, um, assessed and awarded through the business school. I should also stress that these are not hardship scholarships. Um, these are awarded to outstanding female candidates based on the breadth and depth of experience, professional experience, as well as um, past academic performance. And um, these are initiatives that we've put in place over the past um, few years, they've been running for quite a few years now, um, to, to really look at following one of the school's missions, which is around the idea of um, looking at women in leadership and um, making sure that that, that um, pathway is, is there. So um, not necessarily saying that women are not getting the sponsorship through their own organisations, but just look at what else we might, might be doing to make sure there is a um, a good funnel of, of women going through to senior leadership positions. Okay, so um, obviously you can find this information on the school website as well. It's, it's really just to highlight these options are here. I would ask you to pay particular attention to the deadlines. So for the scholarship for the MSc and Major Programme Management, you will need to submit your full programme application by Monday the 11th of June. Um, I would encourage you to submit a lot earlier than that. Um, there, there is no um, reason to hold back your application, but you um, will need to submit your programme application by the 11th of June um, for the Executive MBA for the September 2018. Apologies, that's my error there. September 2018 Executive MBA intake. You will need to apply um, your full application for the Executive MBA by the 21st of May 2018. Um, in terms of the other thing to stress is um, these scholarships where we've got percentages, they are absolutely 50% of the program fee um, rather than any kind of cost uh, money to all funding towards your accommodation or travel. Um, in a couple of other things to be aware of, um, in terms of submitting your application to um, the program, we ask that if you want to be considered for the scholarship for women, you make sure that you have ticked the appropriate women's scholarship box in the funding section. So this is on the online application form. Um, you'll be able to see it. It's, it's almost impossible to miss. As you go through the funding section, you'll see that there is a, um, a separate box to tick for the executive MBA and the MPM for the women's scholarship. Um, and you will be asked to upload a supporting statement, which is about your... Um, your, about your application for the scholarship rather than your application for the programme. And I would strongly encourage you to go onto the website and find out more. Um, and we will circulate these slides so you can link through to those pages or, or give myself or Jonathan a call and we can talk you through any of that as well. Okay, so, and I'm really aware that I'm going through that quickly. We just want to make sure that we get onto everything. So I'll just hand over to Jonathan and he'll take you through a couple more scholarship options. 
Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, again, for, due to uh, sort of pressures of time, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail today on, on each scholarship, but want to uh, very much draw your attention to, e to each one and give a brief overview of the, uh, the different criteria involved. Um, so the first one, um, as you can see there, is the Oxford Alumni Scholarship, and, and I should say these, these are scholarships specifically for, for EMBA students. Um, that equates to 50% of the uh, of the program fee, uh, and in order to be in order to be eligible for that, um, you must have a degree from the the University of Oxford. So that's that's pretty straightforward. Um, the director scholarships that we that we offer, the the criteria for these are you know they're a little bit different, um, but they, they will look at things such as academic excellence, um, diversity, and certainly preference will be given to uh, to those applicants from a non traditional background. The purpose of these uh, director scholarships is is very much to um, very much to to to, to maximise the diversity of the cohort and make sure that people are drawn from a range of different industry sectors as well as different geographies and and, and all of that kind of thing. And there is, a, there is a short essay that you need to put together in order to, to, to apply for that and be considered, but every applicant um, who every applicant for the Executive MBA is, is entitled to apply for the Director Scholarships. Um, another scholarship worth flagging, which has uh, just been introduced this year actually, um, and will be available for the, the September intake of the Executive MBA this year, uh, is the Linbury Scholarship. Now there are actually three awards. Um, which are uh, given out per calendar year across the full-time MBA and the executive MBA uh, and that can be split either way in, over the two programs. Um, but these awards are specifically for individuals from the arts, heritage or culture sectors. Um, you must be ordinarily resident in the UK um, and be able to demonstrate a long-term commitment to one or more of those sectors. Um, it, 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 it's not strictly speaking the case that you need to be currently working in one of those sectors, um, although that is, that is probably the, the more likely avenue, um, but you certainly must, as part of your application, be able to demonstrate that you're committed to one of those sectors in the long term um, and that your, um, your, your, your working activity post-graduation would be in one of those sectors. Um, so the scholarship actually came about through the Lindbury Trust, um, which um, obviously has connections with the Sainsbury family, and they were very keen to ensure that people from the arts and culture um, sectors in particular were, were able to, to access um, executive education at, at Oxford, um, conscious that these people might not always be in the, the best paid positions and wanted to, to do something to help to help to remedy that and uh, this is the, the first year for, for those particular scholarships. Um, at the bottom of that slide there you will see that there are also other university scholarships that you are you are able to, to look at as well. Um, so have a look at the, uh, at, the, at the link there at the bottom of the screen. Um, that's not ne necessarily something that we at the Business School are, are hugely involved in, um, but definitely something that's worth exploring from your point of view when you're uh, sort of pulling the whole funding piece together. Fantastic. And um, I was just going to mention there's, uh, as I said earlier on, the uh, University of Oxford web pages have a wealth of resource. Um, Unfortunately, you may find that there isn't anything applicable to your circumstances, but I always um, say to candidates, it's absolutely worth going on to these pages, so the external scholarships page, and then um, the other one that we've entitled Other Funding Sources, there's a um, publication called The Alternative Guide to Postgraduate Funding. It's absolutely worth going into both of those pages and looking through and seeing if there's anything applicable um, to your own circumstances. Um, so, in, in terms of timing, um, we're going to close now, I think. It, it looks like um, it's been difficult for a lot of people to stay on, and um, there are a couple of other questions that came through that we haven't got through uh, back to you on. We will absolutely um, be going back to people on a one-to-one -one basis, um, particularly on these, these more specific circumstances. And um, we just really want to thank everybody for dialing in today and, uh, and listening through to the end. And if you haven't already been in contact with my, myself, with Jonathan, with another member of the Executive MBA team, or, or indeed another member of the wider team looking at the, the full-time MBA or the postgraduate diplomas that we mentioned earlier, um, please do get in contact with us directly. Um, we will absolutely be circulating the slides shortly, and um, we hope to have more conversations with you. 
Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And as, uh, as Sarah says, if, um, you know, if, you, if you do have questions regarding one of the other uh, executive degree programs that, that Oxford offers, which, uh, which we don't cover, um, feel free to, to touch base with either Sarah or myself, and we'll, we'll definitely point you in the, in the right direction in terms of point of contact. But uh, thanks very much for joining us today. Hope it's been useful, and uh, look forward to following up with some of you in the near future. Thank you. Bye.